Hello, my name is Saptak Sen. I'm a senior product manager in the Microsoft Azure Data Platform team. So today we are going to spend some time uh, going through our overall Azure Data Platform and specifically focus on big data. And with me, I have Bill Ramos. Thank you, Saptak. My name is Bill Ramos. I'm a VP of Consulting Services with Advaya, and I'm going to be the demo master for these presentations. Awesome. So let's get started. Now, uh, before we get started, um, let's quickly uh, cover what we are going to cover, uh, the topics that we are going to cover in this module. We are going to look up, we are going to first figure out why big data. Uh, then we are going to look about, uh, talk about the big data Lambda architecture. And finally, we are going to see uh, what are the different um, capabilities of the Azure Data Platform to get you started on your first big data project. Now, why big data? Now, the, I think these are the four basic drivers for big data. Uh, different people have different opinions. If you ask in a, in a room full of people, you, you'll find many, many different opinions. But as I have gone around, talked to customers, I think these are some of the key drivers. The first one, human fault tolerance. I don't mean it's the capability to tolerate other people's fault, <laughs> but it's more like um, we make mistakes. Uh, we make mistakes in our lives, we make mistakes in our work. Uh, which DBA hasn't deleted a database by mistake? Everyone has, I means every did, uh, database administrator worth their salt have. That's almost their point of graduation. Uh, now, this kind of mistakes happen, so we need to have a system which can tolerate this. That's what I mean by human fault tolerance. And sometimes, this fault that happened due to human error or even malicious and uh, intent, you know, can cost millions or billions of dollars in data loss, especially in this today's world where we uh, depend on more and more data. The second key driver is to minimize capex. So if again, in this new world of you know lean and agile, nobody wants to invest upfront a ton of money. They want to say, hey, if you've got a project idea, let's go start up something in a very small scale uh, without any capex, see how it goes, and then we can, as it becomes more and more useful, we can you know, put more and more money in. At that point, it, it will be much more justifiable to grow this or uh, grow our investments around this. And the third aspect is, Although we want to start small, but our ambitions are bigger than ever. So we want to have uh, design systems and have know that our platforms can scale when we really, really grow up or when we really, really become popular and so on. So hyperscale on demand is almost a necessity. Without that assurance that even if we start small, we can grow really big. No one wants to bet on that platform, that technology, or that architecture. The fourth aspect is low learning curve. We have so many uh, things to learn, to you know, grasp within our brain. We no longer have the luxury of spending you know, two, three, four, five years of learning a particular technology because by the time we learn and gain that expertise, that technology has become obsolete. Something new and cooler has come uh, around. So, so we have to be very, very agile, have a low learning curve in picking up these technologies. Now, you may ask, what's all this got to do with uh, you know, big data? Now, in, this, in today's world where you know, big data is flooding us in, all these requirements are even more important 
than a small data project because you know of course you know most of us start small and then grow big so hyperscale is very important we still don't want to spend upfront so capex is important we don't want to lose big data in a hurry or in a jiffy due to either uh, you know mistake or malicious intent by some operator so that human fault tolerance is important so I guess I, I made this point uh, well enough. Now, what stands between us and building such a platform which, which um, fulfills all these requirements? It's what we call the CAP theorem. Now, CAP is an acronym. It stands for consistency for C, availability A, and partition tolerance. Now let's go through each one of this. Now we all know if, if you have uh, played with relational databases and relational database technology, you know the ACID, right? Uh, uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Th those three, four properties make are the foundations of every relational database. Consistency is the same C as in ACID. It's it's the ability to or the assurance that at any point all the different data structures are consistent with each other. So when you are doing a query and getting data from all these data, different data structures, you are getting a consist consistent re result set back. That's what consistent means. Availability of course means the, the fact that um, when you query your data, um, your queries return within a certain SLA time, so uh, or returns at all, right? So your database infrastructure is not down or sluggish, which doesn't meet SLA, right? That's availability. And then the th third part, which is which is uh, very important for big data platform, is partition tolerance. Now let me, uh, you know take a step back and tell you why we need partition tolerance. Traditionally, we have seen database systems re scale up. As you put more and more data, you have more and more storage, you have more and more memory, you have more and more CPU horsepower and so on, and you, you scale up. But there is a limit to scale up. The limits, are the, the most crucial limit is the disk I.O. Disk I.O., the increase in disk I.O. bandwidth hasn't kept pace with, say, the, the, um, the amazing advancement we've got from CPU, uh, you, know, um, you know, the clock speed increase or the number of cores uh, in, in a, a CPU and so on. Uh, so that's, you know, even memory has become extremely inexpensive uh, comparatively and um, you can get a lot of memory in a system. But disk, which is one of the slowest subsystem in any um, uh, computer, uh, it, it, the moment you have to touch the disk, you know, your performance goes out of the window. So if you're trying to scan a terabyte of data, on a single hard drive, although you have the storage capacity because you can very easily two or three terabyte drives, it takes a long time to scan that uh, terabyte of data. So the way to overcome that is to partition that data, that terabyte of data, let's say, across many drives. And in, in especially in the world of Big data, when we are not just talking about one terabyte, when we are talking about you know uh, tens of terabytes or even hundreds of terabytes, it's all the more important that that data is sharded or partitioned across many drives. And when we do that, when the data is partitioned across many drives and many systems, when we query such a uh, system, it needs to be partition tolerant to return you a consistent result set. Again, uh, so these three are the three uh, kind of the vertex of a, um, you know, uh, a trade-off triangle, so to say. 
the CAP theorem says that you can get only two of these three, right? So that's the challenge. You either have to give up consistency or availability or partition tolerance. Oftentimes, you can sacrifice a little bit on the consistency and gain on availability and partition tolerance. Now, that forces us to have two separate systems. One where consistency is paramount of paramount importance, like any transactional system. And then the analytic system where you really need to scale out because you have your big data and you need to be available, it to be available all the time, there you can sacrifice the consistency uh, by, uh, by you know, chunk, cranking up availability and partition tolerance. Now, what is the solution for this? You know, big data lambda architecture, and it is a community proposed architecture, addresses some of the challenges we have that we discussed in the last slide. Let's talk about how it addresses some of the challenges. Now, it proposes that we break up our data infrastructure, not break up, have essentially three parts to our data infrastructure. The batch layer, the speed layer, and the serving layer. Let's look at each of this layer a little bit more in detail. The batch layer. Now, batch layer stores a immutable data set. So as more and more data comes in, it keeps adding data to it. You cannot update any data to it, data already stored in it. You can only add to it. The reason is that Remember one of the requirements, the ability to tolerate human fault, and that human fault could be accidental or malicious, but uh, so in such a, uh, to, to guarantee that, you need to make sure that nobody can delete or um, can update data in place. They can only add to it. If something has changed, a state has changed, it needs to come in as additional data with the timestamp and the new state, right? So that tells us that the state has changed. So we really don't need to delete or update data. That's the key thing. The other requirement is that it needs to be horizontally scalable. What that means is that today I cannot foresee how much data storage or, you know, data query uh, capacity I would require in six months from now, two years from now, five years from now. I need to be able to grow that. I need to be able to horizontally scale. I cannot scale up because I, there is no way I can get a bigger machine, right? And, and if, even if I can, it's extremely expensive. I just need, I don't need to be, uh, I, uh, Blah blah. So <laughs> I don't have to invest upfront on that big machine, right? I can keep adding storage and processing as I go along. Um, of course, this has some challenges. It it gives us a system which has high latency, right? Uh, because uh, because it provides some uh, benefits of that, which is unrestrained computation or arbitrary queries, right? I can query anything, form any query to this system and fire to it. And it's going to go scan through all that data and eventually come back with that result. So that means I can't design indexes which speeds up queries for only certain queries. Even if I have design indexes for certain queries, any queries which doesn't match those, uh, in that index design will still take longer. So it is, for most queries, it will have high latency. But the benefit is that I can do any arbitrary query to this data. So that's the nature of the batch layer. Let's talk about the speed layer a little bit. 
Now, speed layer addresses some of the shortcomings of the batch layer. So, speed layer, as data is coming in, it does near real time. Uh, now, real time is, of course, depends on the definition. Um, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, hardware manufacturer or, or a real time operating system guys, for them it's like picoseconds uh, and microseconds is what real time means. But for us, real time means within seconds or so on. So as data is flowing in, I can apply uh, some kind of analytics and processing when it's flying in. And I can store the raw data into the data lake, the, the immutable data store, which is the batch layer. But at the same time, I'm going to talk about another layer pretty soon, the serving layer. I can update the serving layer with some of the crucial information. So what this gives me is to cut down the latency, high latency we talked about in the batch layer. The high latency uh, prevents us from getting up to the minute updates through the serving layer. So uh, through speed layer, I can address some of that. Also, if there is any mistake or any uh, you know, human error that happens in the speed layer by uh, you know, faulty rules or whatever, we can recover from that because we have the raw data stored in the batch layer always. We can throw out everything that the speed layer has done and updated uh, to the uh, serving layer. We can throw that apart out and then we can um, uh, update the entire serving layer from the batch layer. So that gives us some insurance against any issues or errors and so on. So let's talk about the serving layer. Serving layer, as you uh, would have imagined by now, is where it lets you do low latency query against the data. So as data is coming in through the speed layer, the speed layer updates the serving layer uh, in near real time, within seconds or minutes, whatever your organization's SLA is, whatever you can you know, tolerate. And then the, the speed layer also stores the raw data into the batch layer. And over time, say nightly or weekly, again, whatever your latency tolerant is, you can have a much richer uh, uh, computed views and indexes which gets updated into the serving layer to provide that low latency interaction uh, that the end users need with their data. Because, you know, frankly, who wants to kind of uh, go to a web page, click a button and come back in five days to see the results, right? Or even five minutes to see the results. They want it immediately. If you are using Excel, connect, you want to see things happening immediately, irrespective of how small or how big the data is. So this serving layer is crucial in providing that, uh, that kind of a low latency interaction possible. So with that, uh, here we, in, in our Azure data platform, we have many different capabilities and technologies. Um, here are some of the you know, pieces and how they fall in the different layers. Let's talk about some uh, real life case studies. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about Yahoo. Yahoo actually had a project called the Tao project and it, it, this project came out from the uh, collaboration between Microsoft and Yahoo after the partnership around the search engine went through. So whenever you go and search something on Yahoo, it's the Bing search engine which powers those queries. But everything else on that page, search page, the advertisements and, and other uh, content on that page is provided by Yahoo. Now, the data analysts at Yahoo obviously are very interested in knowing how effective 
uh, you know, all that content around the search is. So they want to know the, or uh, look at the clickstream data from the Yahoo search pages. Now there's a collaboration between Bing and Yahoo where Bing provides um, multiple terabytes of data every day to Yahoo around all this clickstream data. And the Yahoo data analysts need to very quickly, you know, consume, put it in a serving layer so that they can interact with the BI tools and other tools that they're used to. So if you didn't know, I means one of the, you know, uh, key technologies around big data, Hadoop, was created by Yahoo, right? Um, and open sourced it, of course. Um, but so they, they, they decided they're going to use Hadoop to extract the interesting entities from that raw clickstream data that Microsoft was providing it to you. But when they uh, extracted that information that they wanted to stage it into a low latency data store so that their traditional BI tools can go against it. So they chose SQL Server Analysis Services as the platform of their choice where they can now use Excel, Tableau, um, other Microsoft BI tools to go interact with it. And in fact, the SQL Server Analysis Services Cubes, a couple of years back, um, was 24 terabytes. It's, uh, it has grown since. It's a partitioned cube, and, and it provides that low latency um, access to insights from the familiar tools. Now let's talk about Ferranti. Now, in, in case of Ferranti, um, again, they had a lot of um, streaming data coming in to the batch layer, which is Azure HD Insight Services. Now, once they have that data and they run their HD Insight jobs to extract the interesting entities, they surface that data through SQL Server in-memory OLTP, which is often known as Hackathon, or they also subs can subscribe to that data through the reactive uh, extensions. And we are going to talk about reactive extensions in a, a later module. We are going to see some demos. Um, and um, what it lets you do is to subscribe to some of the... Um, key business rules getting fulfilled when it can be alerted, your application can be alerted, in short. With that, um, let's go on to the first, oops, I went back, let's go in front, uh, the demo, and, yeah. and Bill is going to show you how <laughs> to set up this batch layer that we talked about so much on top of Hadoop, so Hadoop HD Insight Service. Yep, thank you, Saptak. So what I'm gonna do here is get started. I've already created a live ID uh, that's already subscribed to Windows Azure. I just wanted to show the starting point here is you'll go to uh, windowsazure.com to, to get kicked off. Um, from there, we'll go into our portal where we'll log in with our ID. And once I'm logged in with my ID, I'm display, uh, uh, Windows Azure displays all the various services that it has available. What I'm gonna focus on first off is to create a storage account, which will allow us to store our uh, HD Insight data in a consistent place. Now these storage accounts, as Saptak alluded to, um, have a lot of spinning hard drives that help support the, the subsystem. And so that gives us a, a lot of the throughput that we need for our application. To get things started on the storage account, I'll go ahead and click on storage and then simply create new uh, and choose the quick create option. From here, I'll give it a name, big data jumpstart. And I'm then, uh, then I'm, uh, I have this option here for the location affinity group. Now it's important that my HD Insight um, storage and the cluster are on the same location. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and I'm using um, 
East US for my location. I have an option also to enable geo-replication, which gives you the ability to actually go through and set up uh, uh, your storage in a replicated way so that you have fault tolerance over that data. And then I simply hit create storage account. Now at this point, um, this little active progress guy here is showing me what's going on and says creating the storage account. And while that's creating, I think uh, now would be a good time. Uh, Let me give a tip in the meantime. Yeah, give a tip. So that little enable geo replication checkbox that you saw, um, as Bill uh, mentioned, that it provides you geo replication, as the name <laughs> suggests, so that it, your data is in multiple data centers. For some reason, if you can't reach one data center, you can go and still get your data from the other data center. But it also means from a billing perspective, there's a charge between data um, egress when the data comes out. So, um, so there will be charges incurred in moving that data between multiple data centers. So, um, if you really don't need geo replication, uh, you might save some cost by turning that off. That's one. The other aspect to understand is that because of how HD Insight services work, and we are going to talk about it in much more detail uh, very soon, um, your um, storage account and your cluster needs to be in the same data center. And it's for the same reason. You can't put your cluster in a different data center than your storage account because then you'll always incur this huge cost of moving this data uh, across data centers just for processing it, um, and which is not just expensive, but it's also slow. So, uh, and we are going to talk more about it when we talk about the whole blob store okay. details. Well, yeah. you managed to... Um Spend enough time, so now we have our storage container set, or our storage account set up. And you can see right here, uh, Big Data Jumpstart's been created, and we see, most importantly, it's online. So that tells us it's ready to go. By clicking on the storage account, it gives us a nice little dashboard of what's going on here. And one of the things I need to do now is I'm going to set up uh, two containers as part of my storage account for our uh, HD Insight system. So, very simply, I can say create a container, and I'll give it a name. And for our jumpstart, or for our uh, effort here, I'm going to create a container called Hadoop root. And this is where uh, HD Insight is going to put all its working files um, for uh, the HD Insight cluster. The other storage account that I'm going to create is a container here, and I'm going to call this one working. And this is where I'm going to put all our uh, Hadoop files and things like that so that we can actually um, do our Hive jobs and stuff like that. And it's going to be a place where we put our application files and things like that. So I'll go ahead and create that. And you'll notice it created this thing called a blob container. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to SAPDAC so that he can give you an overview of uh, the Hadoop storage uh, mechanism. Uh, sure, thank you, Bill. So uh, let's uh, discuss a little bit about the Azure Blob Store. Now, whenever he was mentioning storage, it's, uh, he was uh, referring it to the Azure Blob Store. Now, Azure Blob Store, as we discussed, is a distributed storage right, on top of Azure. And it's, it's very uh, simple and transparent to you because um, you don't need to worry about how many nodes, you know, how it's uh, distributed, whether it's fault tolerant or not. Everything is taken care of or how to configure the fault tolerance. And so everything is taken care of. So for you, it looks like one giant unlimited hard drive in, in the sky. You can keep putting data in into that uh, uh, into that um, uh, storage account. Now, the the only aspect is that it's it doesn't have a folder hierarchy in it. 
It's a single level um, storage. You can, so every storage is, has an account associated with it. So if you have a subscription, Azure subscription, that's your account, right? And within the account, you can have multiple containers. Now containers are, uh, you know, uh, structures which uh, provides you a way to kind of um, um, uh, almost logically separate different kind of um, data that you want to store. And within, within the uh, container itself, you can have multiple blobs or files or however you might want to refer it to them. And then within that, there are then pages and blocks which you don't need to really worry about most of the time. Uh, now, when we will use HD Insight, and, and Bill is going to show the demo in the next step, uh, HD Insight is basically 100% Apache Hadoop. So Apache Hadoop uh, expects a file system structure, right? It, it, it needs, uh, it expects some kind of folder structure and so on. So that is emulated on this blob storage. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and create the cluster. Let's go ahead and create the cluster. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and create our HD Insight cluster. Um, so we've, we're sitting here in our storage area here. Now this little disk drive here with all those uh, funny little lines across it that you see right here is our HD Insight icon. And so to get things kicked off, I'll go to our HD Insight um, panel here. And we see we already have several clusters already created. I'm going to go ahead and create a new one that we'll use in the lab. And so I'll go ahead by issuing new. And then I'm going to use custom create here. I'm going to create my um, big data jumpstart uh, cluster name. I indicate that uh, I can supply uh, four nodes. Um, I can actually choose a lot more nodes than that, um, but you can go up to 32 nodes in the default uh, console. Uh, you can go much bigger. If you ha need a bigger cluster, just let us know. We'll be happy to give you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, we've got your credit card information on file when we do that, right? Okay, so the next thing, uh, actually this is a new feature uh, for backward compatibility. You can actually select your HD Insight uh, version. The default will be the latest one. And here's where we choose our region. You can see here we have three regions. Uh, Northern Europe, which is, I think, Ireland, is that correct? Yeah, it's yeah. Dublin. Or Dublin, yeah. yeah. And then uh, Western uh, US and Eastern US. We're going to choose Eastern US because if you recall, that's where we created our storage account. Uh, we're going to create an admin name and a password. By the way, more geographies are coming online every other month. Yep. Now, another thing that you can do is uh, indicate whether you want to do a Hive or Uzi Metastore. And if I was to select this, what this would do is set up the Hive uh, data warehouse, which we're going to talk about in a, in a future module. It'll actually set up all that metadata on a SQL Server database. We're going to keep things simple uh, for the session, and we'll just uncheck that right now, or leave it unchecked, uh, where it will actually create it on the uh, HDFS uh, file system for our HD Insight cluster. Uh, we're going to indicate that the storage account uh, is actually using an existing one, and so we're going to use uh, the one that we just created, which is our big data jumpstart, and we can specify our, our default container. Uh, I just happened to pick uh, the first one in alphabetical order, which is our Hadoop root. In addition, I can specify additional storage accounts if I have um, other data from other places that I want to integrate into my Hadoop cluster. Uh, I can actually go ahead and specify them here. Go ahead and click complete to kick things off. And I'm going to go to the detail section, and what this is doing now is it's spinning up our HD Insight cluster. Um, so the first part is just letting the Azure service know that it's uh, submitting the job, um, and then uh, the infrastructure and the operations center says it's, it's now going through an acceptance process uh, to make sure all the data is consistent. Right. And, uh, here, uh, what does it normally take, about 10 minutes or so? Yeah, it takes about uh, about 
10 Five. to 12 minutes, you know. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the, uh, you know, uh, it's mood, I guess. It's, it's, yeah, there's but, a, lot, uh, a lot of things going on. But the point is that what it's uh, ah, doing cool. is that um, it's actually setting up the VMs and the cluster for you. Uh, the cool thing is that you can do all this from the API. Uh, not just that, uh, the whole thing is that if you have noticed by now, the storage account and the cluster is kind of loosely coupled. What that means is that the cluster that you are creating here can be easily be deleted without any data loss because your data is sitting in, in the Azure blob storage, right? Um, so you can bring up a really big cluster like we were discussing. I Means let's say you bring up, um, I don't know, 200 node cluster, right? And 200 node cluster running it for months and months can be expensive, right? So instead you bring it up, you do the processing you need, store it back, store the data back into Azure Blob Store and yank the uh, cluster out of service or decommission the cluster. That lets you collapse the wall clock time required to do the processing at the same time, it provides you the flexibility that you don't have to keep spending money for the time that you don't are not using the cluster. Yep, yep. And we'll actually demo how that can all be automated using PowerShell and Module 5 today, Awesome, awesome. Which is really cool. So if we flip back to the display here, there's a couple things that have been going on. Uh, we zoom down here. Uh, we can see that our cluster storage has been provisioned, and so that means it's setting it up uh, within our system. And now we're in the process of configuring the four nodes, uh, the four VMs, one of which will be a head node, and the other ones will be uh, worker nodes as part of that. And uh, with that, we'll let this uh, run for a little bit longer. And in fact, I think we can probably flip back over to the demo. The one thing I wanted to just check out here is back in my container here, uh, we see that we have our Hadoop container. And you see, it, since it's still being provisioned, there's no blobs in it. Once the HD Insight cluster is uh, configured and everything like that, we'll start to see a lot of data in here as it's going on. OK. So should we upload the files now? Uh, I think we could actually try to do the upload of the files. Yeah, right. let's go ahead and do that to, to get things going. And so what we're going to do now is kind of skip ahead. And um, I'm going to show you another feature here after I, uh, I guess that thing just wants to keep on, there we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some data files and upload them into our working directory. And I'm going to do that using um, a little utility here that's available on Coplex, and we'll provide links to all the pointers to this. And we're going to use this thing called the storage, uh, or the Azure Storage Explorer uh, that's on Coplex. Now I'm going to need, um, one little piece of information. Actually, it's a very important piece of uh, information. If I go to the dashboard, there's a feature here called Manage Access Keys. And this is what application programs need to be able to access the data. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this to the clipboard and paste it uh, in a little application buffer here. I'm going to need that in just a moment. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and say um, add an account. And here's where I need to add my storage name. And so it's big data jumpstart. And I have my account key, which right there in the clipboard. Kids don't try to memorize this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure you're not doing this on a little iPhone or something, or a Windows phone or something like that, typing it in. Uh, so we'll go ahead and add our storage account. And what this is doing now is you see here it's enumerated our containers. In fact, uh, there's our working and our Hadoop uh, container. And what I'm going to do is we're going to get our data files that we're going to need for this application from the World Wide Webs. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to pull in some census information from the US government. 
Now, the reason that we are using this particular data set uh, is because uh, we wanted you to be able to almost follow along. So you can do exactly the same. Uh, I know you, you might have a lot more data within your organization, and in all the demos that here we do, it will be not as big as the uh, data sets that you will eventually play with. But this is a great way to learn, and we wanted to be sure that this data is public and you can get to it. So Yep. Okay, so we're going to take uh, these two files. What the, uh, the U.S. Census Department has done is created two CSV files, uh, which I'm going to go ahead here and say save as target, and we're going to stick this over in a data drive. Now I'm actually changing the extension of this. Uh, just so that Excel doesn't open up the file. And we're gonna go ahead and hit save here. And the download's complete. And I'll down get the next one here. So save target as. I'm gonna name this two. Okay, now that I have those two files here, I'll go ahead and open up the file, and I just realized I need to call this extension in lowercase. One of the things that you're gonna learn, um, and hopefully not by my fault, is, is that everything in HD Insight is pretty much case sensitive. And so file names and things like that, you wanna make sure are absolutely precise. So we have our two data files. The next thing I need to do is make a little tweak on these data files. Normally when you get big data, you don't have headers uh, in that data. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this top line of data that's uh, in the file system and get rid of it. But while I'm here, I'm gonna show you just a quick uh, view of the structure of the data that we're gonna be working with. Um, so there's a sum level here, which is just a, a, um, a value that the Census Department uses to keep track of uh, various information. We have our state name and our county name, and the county name can also be parishes and other things like that. Uh, then what we have is fields for sex, origin, age group, and I'm gonna underline this one right here. And then we have um, race information and then a population value here. And so what this is doing is it's saying, okay, for this particular county and the census value here, um, in the age group, which one represents infant, uh, in this county, there were essentially 1,337 people in that, in that census group. Okay, but the key thing I want to do here is, now that you see the data, because we're going to come back to that a little later when we start doing MapReduce jobs, is I, got, I need to delete this top line. Now, I could have coded it, but I'm a little lazy, and I'm just going to hit save here. And let's go save. And I'm going to load in the second file as well. I'm just going to delete that top line. Yeah, in, in real life, uh, most of the data that you'll get, uh, that you'll use something like HD Insight to process, is either machine-generated data and so on. And those typically won't have those headers anyways, so you won't have this problem. Um, but as, uh, as Bill said, uh, Hadoop is great in extracting the information that you need uh, from all the noise or extracting the signal from the noise. So you could have easily have ignored that in, the, in your Hadoop program. But for this particular uh, workshop, we wanted to keep it simple. So we are doing that part manually. We'll, we'll show you the, how to process this. Okay. Uh, yep. So uh, the, one of the reasons we're using the Azure Storage Explorer is because uh, there are limits to um, file sizes that can be loaded with the HD Insight um, uh, cluster. And so what we're going to do is uh, avoid those limits right now by using this tool. So what I'm going to do is go down here to say Upload and then go to my data drive. And I can also multi-select items, which is nice, and say Open. And now this is going ahead and uploading our files to the system. So we see our first one, 
and our second one. Okay, so at this point, let's just take a peek. Oh, still not there yet. Um, we have our data uploaded to the system, and I'm going to now go back to my count keys here and let's see what's going on with our cluster here. So now we're in the um, we're in the process of creating all the, the cluster information from the nodes. The virtual machines have already been created and we're, we're on the last stage of configuration right now for HD Insight cluster. So yeah, in, in a couple of minutes I, I'm guessing it should be done. Yeah, probably about the time we say, hey, let's stop right now and see if, uh, just let it go and see how long it takes. Probably about the time we figure that out and we say stop, it's probably gonna finish up. So, um, got anything to, anything else to share here as far as the HD Insight cluster configuration and loading data? Thoughts about that? So, uh what it's doing now is if you if you really want to dig into it it's actually changing the configuration files of apache hadoop running on uh, on azure to make sure it works on azure right but at the same time if you go go into it, it, your remote desktop into the cluster you can actually see the raw config files so if you are a experienced Hadoop admin, you, you know, don't think this is some different kind of Hadoop. This is Apache Hadoop, uh, the, you know, the best version possible, the most open version possible, and then um, it's just uh, automatically configuring it to be, uh, to be able to be used on Azure. So all your existing Hadoop programs and, and jobs should work as is uh, on on Azure, uh, so that's that's the key point. Okay, so why don't we let this thing run for a little bit and come back when it's uh, ready? Okay, we're back and our cluster's created. So if we can flip back over to the demo machine here, I'll show you what we've got going on. Okay, so we can see here down at the bottom of the screen now, our HD Insight cluster uh, configuration is complete, and now it indicates it's running. And you can tell it's running also by looking at our status here. And you can see it was created with the latest version. Now I'm going to do uh, one thing or a couple things here. First off, we'll go back to our storage explorer. And if we look at our Hadoop root, you'll see there's a lot more files in the system now. And so these are example files and things like that that are used to um, support the, um, the samples that are also in the cluster. Uh, we have our, our Hive warehouse and a bunch of uh, user uh, files here. Now that's it for the file explorer. One more thing I also want to show you is just a quick demo of how we can see what's going on in our cluster 2 by using our console. And so by selecting our particular console that I want, I can uh, issue the manage cluster command here, which will allow us to go in and connect to um, the overall tile display for our account. Now, for our password, or for our username, we'll use the one that we created here along with its password. And go ahead and log on. And this is going in and uh, launching the user interface for our cluster management system. And uh, we'll let this thing go a little bit here. And here we have our interactive console, uh, in addition to a bunch of other things here, which we'll talk about in a little more detail later on. But our interactive console allows us to do things as if we're kind of operating in a, in a Hadoop uh, console itself, where I can do things like uh, do a directory of the files that we were looking at. So uh, with um, HD Insight, uh, it does help to learn a little bit of Linux so that you know things like the ls command, uh, where we can go ahead and then type in the uh, AWS or the Azure Blob Storage Protocol. We indicate our container and then our, let's see, big data jumpstart. 
and then we do dot blob dot core and this is pretty much the same whenever you're specifying any of the uh, Azure storage dot net and if we do that we see our two census files uploaded uh, onto our Azure blob storage accessible through our HD Insight cluster. Yay! Woohoo! Yeah, baby! Okay, so now we've got uh, our cluster up and running, data ready to go. Let's go ahead and uh, finish up with the slideware and sure. wrap this up. So, as you saw, we just set up one piece of the whole puzzle. That's the batch layer, right? Now, let's. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick preview. We are going to talk about each one of these aspects uh, in much more in detail, but a quick uh, preview of what are the other pieces. Of course, means for BI, uh, business intelligence, Excel is our cornerstone product. Now, within Excel, there are many capabilities. Uh, one of the new capabilities is like Power Query. Now, Power Query lets you connect to any data source or most data source and very easily consume and shape and feed that into a data model. Now, when I talk about data model, most of the time I'm talking about the power pivot model. The power, power pivot model is basically a in-memory vertipack cube, right, within Excel. Now, once you have it in that model, what you can do is then you can publish it to either SharePoint or uh, in um, uh, SQL Server Analysis Services. Now, for, you can also do visualization from it using Power View and so on. Um, HD Insight we saw and we will see much more in detail how to uh, consume and process structured and unstructured data. And then of course, we have the ability using things like Polybase. Now Polybase is one of the key features of our parallel data warehouse appliance which lets you query um, uh, um, data stored on Hadoop uh, in using a T-SQL, full fidelity T-SQL language. And it uses the SQL Server's query engine to create the artifacts or the you know, predicates required to do, do those processing on um, Hadoop and push it down to Hadoop, does that processing gives you back. It, for an end user or for an application, it's extremely simple they don't even, most of the time, they don't even need to know that they are going against data stored on Hadoop. Um, so the idea that we want to uh, give through this slide is that here we are trying to provide you an end-to-end big data pl a platform where we have all the different pieces required for your data insight scenarios all covered and, and we are going to cover much more of those. Now here are some links. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to get started, you can go directly on the MSDN blogs um, around HD Insight uh, of what we did and much, much more. In this module, we covered you know, the motivation around a big data infrastructure. We also covered how to create your own big data infrastructure on Azure and how simple it is. Now, in the next module, we are going to talk about how you can uh, use, the, use MapReduce as your uh, big data processing paradigm to process you know, uh, st structured and unstructured data on top of Hadoop. Um, so with that, uh, we are going to come back in a few minutes with the next module.